Good evening, friends. Let me first of all thank TAS, the anesthetist group, and especially Dr. Hethel for giving me this opportunity to present my topic. My topic for today's presentation is spinal anesthesia. Can it be different? I will be talking mainly about the most controversial topic of segmental spinal and then in short about the hyperbaric spinal and continuous spinal anesthesia. Now first what is a routine spinal anesthesia? Routine spinal anesthesia is what everyone is practicing uh, that means a spinal below L2 levels with hyperbaric drugs, gravity dependent spread mostly used for below umbilical surgeries, patients not mobilized early urinary retention, delayed bladder control, great hemodynamic fluctuations occurring with when high doses and levels are used. Now what can be different? It can be a no gravity dependency, low dose high spinals, daycare spinals with early ambulation and voiding. There can be stable hemodynamics even with high levels of block. In short, yes, a subarachnoid block can be tamed according to need with the use of different drugs and techniques. Now what are the different types of spinal anesthesia? Apart from the routine lumbar, saddle or unilateral spinal everyone is using, it can be a segmental or a selective spinal anesthesia, either using a low dose of local anesthetic drugs or it can be a graded sequential or continuous spinal anesthesia. Continuous spinal anesthesia using a subarachnoid catheters and any of the drugs that is iso, hypo or hyperbarics. And now even continuous segmental spinal anesthesia is a possibility. Before going to the main topic, some basic points about the spinal anesthesia. There are some factors postulated to alter the spinal anesthesia block height. More than 20 factors are there, but the main important factors are patient characteristics, technique of injection, characteristics of CSF, characteristics of anesthetic drugs. There are some controllable factors like dose, volume to concentration, the site of injection along the near axis, a baricity of local anesthetic solution, posture of the patient. And there are some factors which are not controllable as volume of CSF, density of CSF. There are few important definitions in the context of today's presentation. First is the density, weight in grams of 1 ml of the solution at a standard temperature. The second is specific gravity is a ratio of the density of a solution to density of water. Third is baricity is the ratio comparing the density of one solution to another. The CSF characteristics CSF at 37 degrees centigrade has a specific gravity of 1.003 to 1.008 mean value of 1.0069. To make a solution hyperbaric to CSF, it must be less dense than CSF with a baricity precisely below 1. Based on this specific gravity, a local anesthetic solution may be isobaric, hypobaric or hyperbaric. This is a slide depicting the what uh, gravity has an influence on baricity. The isobaric solutions will stay at the site of injection, the hyperbaric solutions will move towards the gravity and the hypovaric solutions will move away from the gravity. Now coming to segmental spinal, a little bit about the history. In 1909, Thomas Janesco proposed the term general spinal anesthesia for surgeries of the head, neck and thorax. He made puncturing at subarachnoid space at T1 and T2. He also punctured at mid and lower thoracic levels for thoracic and abdominal surgeries. But it was in 2006 when a new era for segment spinal began when A. Van Zundert gave a thoracic spinal for laparoscopic cholecystectomy in a patient with COPD. Since then there have been many studies exploring its utility and many different surgical procedures for, uh, for example thoracic, abdominal or breast surgeries. Now what is segmental spinal anesthesia? The term is often used synonymously with thoracic spinal anesthesia but in real sense Blocking of the required dermatomes essential for the proposed surgical procedure with a very low effective local anesthetic dose. This often necessitates dural puncture at high lumbar or thoracic levels. Lower the dose of the drug used more likely to produce a true segmental block. Is it possible? Yes, practically all the abdominal surgeries 
be it upper abdominal, lower abdominal, major surgery, minor surgery, whether it is day care or not, laparoscopy or open, all are possible under segmental spinal alone or it can be combined with epidurals. If that is not all, then the option of continuous segmental spinal anesthesia is a possibility. Understanding of the anatomy of the spinal canal is crucial for segmental spinal. There is a natural thoracic kyphosis at T7, 6 and 5. The amount of CSF at thoracic level is very less. In thoracic nerve roots are very slight and thin. Thus, there is less anesthetic dilution per segmental unit of distance from the site of injection, favoring its efficient blockade at, at these levels. And also, there is no significant difference in the onset time for isobaric and hyperbaric drugs at thoracic levels, whereas the isobaric drugs, they take some time for onset at lumbar levels. This is a picture depicting the landmarks for locating the intervertebral spaces at the thoracic levels. The most prominent vertebra at the uh, C7 spinous process, then at the T3 corresponds with the spine of the scapula. T7 corresponds with the inferior angle of the scapula and roughly a 10 cm uh, distance from the lower end of the lower rib corresponds with the L1. From anywhere from this point, you can locate the required uh, intervertebral space for thoracic spinal. This is a picture, MRI picture depicting the uh, direction of the spinous processes, thickness of the ligamentum flavum epidural space width, epidural pressure, then the dura and the spinal cord. This is the main slide which is very important and this is the crux of the presentation. It is a midline MRI of the spinal column. The cervical enlargement fills almost the entire spinal canal at the level. In the thoracic segments, the spinal cord is positioned anteriorly leaving a significant space between the posterior dura and the spinal cord. At the lumbar level, the lateral space disappears almost completely. Uh, this is a magnified view. Here you can clearly see there is a clear distance between the posterior dura and the spinal cord at the mid thoracic levels. There are some major issues raised while giving segmental spinal. The first is a neurological injury with dural puncture at thoracic or high lumbar levels. The second is ventilatory impairment due to the extensive thoracic nerve blockage. And third is a high spinal which may block the cardiocellular fibers leading to bradycardia and hypotension. Now coming to the first issue, neurological injury. On the MR imaging as you have already seen in the previous slides, there is a definite space between the posterior uh, dura and the spinal cord. And the main important thing is the distance is widest at the mid thoracic level in all positions in the supine sitting and lateral. Sitting and lateral it is even more the positions we generally acquire for giving spinal anesthesia. This is a possible explanation for very low rate of neurological injuries after accidental dural puncture with thoracic epidurals or intended dural puncture in segmental spinal. The people are daily giving thoracic spinal but there is very low rate of neurological injuries with thoracic, thoracic epidurals. With thoracic epidurals it may be seen as a hazard as we are not ready for it, but in thoracic spinals, it is even at a lower risk as we are ready for it and with a very fine needle. In one study, it was found that many anesthetists frequently fail to identify the correct whatever space for giving spinal, especially in obese patients and parturients. Only 29% were found to be correctly identifying the space. They were inadvertently giving the spinal at high lumbar or even thoracic levels. This is a slide depict MRI slide depicting the uh, distance, uh, exact distance at the mid thoracic levels. This study was carried out by M. Belloni and Govia. This is a slide depicting the exact distance in all positions, supine, lateral and sitting positions. You can see in the lateral and sitting positions, the distance is even more than what is in the supine position. This is a pictorial depiction of the MRI at thoracic, lumbar and caudal levels. You can see the spinal cord is placed much anteriorly at the thoracic region, at the lumbar it is almost touching the posterior dura and at the caudal level. This is another pictorial depiction at thoracic, thoracolumbar and cauda ingvana level. Now this lateral uh, uh, MRI picture 
this is very important you can see the angle required at the thoracic level for puncturing the dura that makes the distance even more further because of the angle it will be more clear in the next slide you can see here the distance is almost double than that required at the thoracolumbar level uh, distance is almost 8 millimeter at the uh, thoracic level whereas it is 4.5 millimeters because of the angle required to reach the puncture the dura now the cons spinal cord damage is potentially disastrous complication of spinal anesthesia or indeed dural puncture for any reason for any reason although rare but the risk of neurological complication subsequent to spinal anesthesia is rather real than theoretical with permanent neurological deficit occurring one in 10,000. The second issue was ventilatory impairment. Now the main inspiratory muscle of respiration is diaphragm which is usually unaffected and expiration at rest is usually passive. The forceful expiration and cuffing make it affected due to paralysis of the anterior abdominal wall muscles but the low dose of drugs used usually preserves the cuffing ability due to minimal motor weakness of abdominal muscles. The third issue was bradycardia or hypotension because of the blockade of the cardioacetal fibers. The heart may decrease, heart rate may decrease if high neuroaxial block extend blocking cardioacetal fibers T1 to T4. But as the right atrial feeling is maintained due to the lumbosacral sparing and less venodilatation in the lower limbs that sustains the outflow from intrinsic chronotropic receptors located in right atrium and great veins. And also there is less hypotension due to the low dose of drugs used, less venodilatation. Now coming to segmental spinal, widening the scope, till date it was used only for high risk patients with comorbidities for selective surgeries. With many advantages, segmental spinal is likely to establish as a routine in daycare anesthesia, especially proving its utility during these pandemics. Now the site of injection for abdominal surgeries can be varied. With adequate dose, a space about T10 is hardly required. Space between T10 and L1 for all abdominal surgeries is sufficient. And 7.5 to 10 milligram, that is 1.5 to 2 ml, with added use works for 90 to 120 minutes. This is exactly half the dose required to reach the T3 T2 levels while using customary spinals at lumbar levels. Now, the local anesthetic drug options either isobaric or hyperbaric, both drugs can be preferred, both can be used, but isobaric is usually preferred. Hyperbaric only when gravity dependence is desired. Uh, what are the different local anesthetic drug options? Chlorprocaine 1% is a very good drug, but it's very short acting and the volume required for injection is more. Almost you have to give 3.5 to 4 ml minimum. It is very useful for short duration open and laparoscopic surgeries. Bupivacaine or Leubupivacaine 0.5% is usually preferred. Ropivacaine 0.75% is comparable with Leubupivacaine 0.5%, but being less lipid soluble intrathecally, it is half as potent as Bupivacaine. There is a stronger differentiation between sensory and motor blocks with opioid It is more preferred for daycare surgeries. These are the two ampoules of 4 and 10 ml which I usually use for my segmental spinals. The remaining drug from the 10 ml ampoules I use, I utilize for the blocks. You tell them there are some additives like fentanyl, clonidine or dexmet can lead to increase intensity of the sensory blocks. Advantages are Onset is gradual, there is hemodynamic stability, early recovery and voiding. There are some advantages of isolated drugs in position issues, especially useful in cases where frequent change of positions is needed if hyperbaric drugs were used, especially in lateral position orthopedic surgeries, kidney surgeries, prone position surgeries, uh, especially in orthopedic surgeries so when using hyperbaric drugs what we do is first give a dependent position uh, to the operative side, then turn the patient supine, then again turn the patient um, to lateral position with operative side up. But here you can straightway put the patient in surgical positions before SAB and also when you have to put the patient to the fracture table, even in that case you wait for some time after hyperbaric drugs to settle before uh, shifting the patient on the fracture table. So a lot of the time and effort is saved. And also there is a hemodynamic stability when using isobaric drugs in morbid ill ortho patients. And even in combined spinal epidural, spinal can be given 
before epidural and at a space higher than epidural uh, with using hyperbaric drugs you are worried about uh, getting a unilateral effect if you give spinal before the epidural but this is not the case with isobaric drugs and then disadvantage of the low doses for isobaric drugs level of the block cannot be modified by any change of positions drugs need to be placed at precise dermatomes like in epidural sacral sparing is common in low doses low doses at higher spaces uh, less muscle relaxation may need higher doses in some robust and muscular patients and time limit as with any low dose subarachnoid block coming to my segment spinal profile uh, till that more than 2000 surgeries in last 7 to 8 years initially used for only high risk patients with multiple comorbidities encouraged by the results and safety with due precautions now occupies nearly 50% of my subarachnoid block profile there are few very few partial failures but till date no mishaps i usually combine it with epidurals for major surgeries and for day care surgeries i give either a tap block or a rectus sheath block for post operative analgesia also used in many pediatric patient cases with success and this uh, segmental spinal looks to have good prospects in spine or prone position surgeries where patient can turn to prone position on his own after subarachnoid block or even you can give spinal in the prone position for spine surgeries now coming to the procedure complete pre anesthetic evaluation of the patient venous access minimum mandatory monitoring then no sedative pre medications spinal in lateral decubitus with 27 gauge quinky needle is what i use but you can use any position either sitting or even prone position depending on the patient's parameters physical hemodynamics site and type of surgery the dose of drug and the site of injection is usually selected i use 0.5% dovp vecan with fentanyl clonidine or dexmed in the doses actually 25 micrograms fentanyl clonidine 30 micrograms dexmed 10 micrograms and for average female i use 2 to 2.5 ml including additive maximum and for male muscular and lap surgeries a little more drug is usually used when you are using along with epidural then you can even start with a very low dose with a epidural backup uh, especially in patients with uh, multiple comorbidities when you don't want even a slightest change in the hemodynamics t10 to l1 space for abdominal and l2 to l4 space for some pelvic surgeries is used speed of injection is average as allowed by the bore of 27 gauge needle around 1 ml per 15 seconds the patients are usually turned supine after the block and for lateral position surgeries patients kept in the same position with operative side up sensory block is usually tested by pin prick sets in 3 to 4 minutes and touch sensation which at times may persist especially in the lumbosacral region in very highly anxious patients can be relieved by few milligrams of ketamine or fentanyl 25 micrograms iv the complete block usually sets in 8 to 10 minutes there are usually no drastic hemodynamic fluctuations whatever fluctuations occur occur during the first 10 minutes and very they are very minimal and gradual there is no respiratory embarrassment even with a high levels of block even about t2 initial partial involvement of the lumbosacral roots can be seen especially when you are using lower spaces and higher doses but that usually recurs by the end of surgery no additional supplements in most cases are required barring few lap surgeries when your level of uh, block is not adequate i mean it's not up to t2 t3 then you may need some sedation the patients are usually completely mobilized in 4 to 6 hours remarks fact that the anesthetic technique is not usual does not mean that it's wrong a concept has developed that a regional anesthetic should need no supplements and that if it does it should be considered a failed block this reasoning needs rethinking the patient safety takes precedence over the necessary risk to be taken for the success of procedure and technique is reserved for experienced clinician with good learning curve to sum up very useful technique with many advantages and minimal risk with due precautions takes little a little time to onset and complete effect there is no need to panic even the block level is found to be higher than desired use of a fine gauge needle for day care procedures and lab surgeries may lead 
take a little more sedation as it is under all regionals. Now before proceeding to hyperbaric and continuous spinal anesthesia, I would like to show you some videos, I mean depicting the different uh, uh, features of segmental spinal starting with a simple case of laparoscopic appendicectomy. This is at the end of surgery, at the time of port closure. You can see the complete uh, regression of power in the lower limbs and patient is talking comfortably. Please, uh, this is the same patient ready to shift herself on stretcher at the end of surgery. Please ignore the additional sounds. Now this is to show how simple and straightforward it is at the lower thoracic and high lumbar levels. This is a spinal for a patient of uh, probably an umbilical hernia with multiple comorbidities. These spaces at lower thoracic level are as straight as at the lumbar and high lumbar levels. The heavy draping is avoided to have a clear view of the landmark. Only at the mid thoracic level you get some angulation for spinal and some difficulty but at the lower thoracic and lumbar level it is as straight as your routine spinal. It is just 2 ml with additives for uh, umbilical hernia. This is a, a very obese uh, patient around 132 kg. Uh, for a hysteroscopic removal of a big polyp and I give a, gave a spinal with just 1.75 ml with uh, fentanyl at T12 L1 space. I wanted some effect in the lumbosacral regions also. So I preferred a lower space. This was this patient was around 132 kg. This is the same patient after completion of the procedure within one hour. You can see completely moving her legs and shifted to the ward. You can see the same patient after three and a half hours, ready to go home. This is a morbid old lady for open cholecystectomy. Uh, she had multiple comorbidities. So open cholecystectomy under segmental spinal. This is the same lady, the permission was taken for video. You can see without sedation, she is so comfortable during the procedure. This is a, uh, this was a unique case I had done. This is a traumatic uh, uh, diaphragmatic hernia, which was probably for the first time was done under a sole regional anesthesia. It was done under a combined uh, epidural and segmental spinal. You can see the whole of the intestine and colon was in the left hemithorax. This is the same patient during the mesh repair of the diaphragm. The same patient at the end of surgery, you can see, you can see the complete, complete powers in the legs, you can lift his hips and it was totally pain free and comfortable without any GA. This is the x-ray of the same patient with the expansion of the left lobe of the lung. This is laparoscopic uh, ectopic. You can see the patient moving her legs during the operation. This is a ruptured ectopic with lot of blood inside. This is the same patient shifting herself on the stretcher. 
at the end of surgery at around 50 minutes of surgery this is a huge ventral hernia in a morbid old lady with multiple comorbidities diabetes hypertension isd there are a lot of adhesions with the hernial sac it, those were removed this is the same patient during the mesh repair a huge mesh was uh, placed and you can see complete movement of the legs this was a case of mrm which was done under combined thoracic uh, epidural and spinal the epidural was put at uh, t56 and the spinal was given at t67 you can see th there was a complete uh, levels from uh, below c4 yes. you can see she had uh, no sensation in the fingers but the grip strength was good same patient during the surgery mrm was going on This is a recent patient. Last week I did. This is a DU perforation under segmental spinal. This is again MRM which I did yesterday, and because of which my Facebook account was blocked, so I didn't post the other videos. I just posted this one video here only. Now the another topic that is hypobaric spinal. Hypobaric spinal for a hypobaric spinal uh, the to make the drug hyperbaric relative to CSF, its density must be precisely below 1. Adding 3 ml of distilled water to 2 ml of BP vacant will make a 0.2% solution with a density of 0.9931, which is hyperbaric. Basically used for anorectal surgeries in jackknife positions, also in daycare joint orthoscopies as low dose. But uh, many of my friends from Italy, they are using this drug routinely for other major surgeries because they have that spinocath available. Uh, it can also be used in high risk unilateral limb surgeries. For low limb orthopedic surgeries of limited duration, keep the patient in lateral position with operative side up and a 15-20 degrees head low position. Prepare hypoveric solution by mixing plain bupivacan with sterile distilled water in minimum one minutes to three parts aseptically. Perform the subarachnoid block as usual Keep the patient in same position for 15 to 20 minutes and nice unilateral subarachnoid block sets in on the desired limb. There are some advantages and some disadvantages of this hypobaric spinal. Advantages are very negligible hemodynamic fluctuations can be used for very high risk cases. It has almost negligible hemodynamic fluctuations even less than what uh, occurred uh, with the uh, isobaric drugs. So it can be used in very morbid ill patients. The preferential sensory blockade with uh, minimal motor involvement, uh, it is uh, suitable for early ambulation. Uh, disadvantage is hypobaric solution needs to be prepared and there are chances of contamination. The effect lasts for very limited duration and a less muscle relaxation for orthoscopic procedure, surgeon needs to be accustomed to this less muscle relaxation and uh, there is more of a need for sedatives during these procedures. Another method of formulating a hyperbaric like solution is to warm 0.5% BP vacant. Warmed at 37 degrees, it demonstrates hyperbaric characteristics when given in sitting position. Now coming, this is a jackknife position I have given for some anorectal surgery, given a prone position spinal. Now coming to the last topic, continuous graded or a sequential spinal. This can be a planned technique or a modified after accidental dural puncture while setting epidural. This is a very useful technique but very underused. Uh, continuous spinal anesthesia is useful in key situations which are difficult to manage with either general anesthesia, single shot spinal or epidurals. This is especially useful with patients with uh, heart diseases and especially in PPCM, peripartum cardiomyopathy. This is one of the indicated techniques for managing PPCM. It has a more rapid action, a more pronounced sensory motor blockade with pure hemodynamic fluctuations and side effects. A reduction in fractionation of dose leads to slow onset of sympathetic block, 
that allows the cardiovascular system to adapt more easily. Catheter and drugs, microcatheters 27 gauge and smaller are not available. FDA withdrew its approval in 1992 because of its possible association with Coda Ingona syndrome. But recently they have again reappeared in some western countries and many reports of the epidural needle and catheter uses available with good effect. I also use this same epidural catheter and needle for continuous spinal anesthesia. Intrathecal epidural catheter at times is recommended as treatment to prevent PDPH in accidental dural puncture in epidural. Suppose if you get a uh, dural puncture during uh, sighting the epidural, you can keep the catheter inside for 24 hours. That may be a treatment to prevent the PDPH. Uh, drugs, the isobaric, hyperbaric or a hyperbaric all can be used, but some people prefer using hyperbaric drugs for continuous spinal anesthesia. Repeated use of lignocaine has some issues, concern of uh, transient neurologic DNS, so it should be avoided. Since microcatheters or spinocats are not available here, we use 20 gauge perifix epidural catheters or any flexible catheter via 19 gauge 2 needle space and drug according to the for surgery and hemodynamic status of the patient. Generally 0.5% BP vacant, 1.2 ml initial bolus, 0.2 ml is a catheter dead space and subsequent bolus of 0.5 ml to 1 ml as per requirements with or without additives. The final bolus of 25 micrograms of fentanyl at the end of surgery for post-op analgesia as well as it serves the purpose of flushing the catheter of the drug. Then flushing of the catheter after each bolus with normal saline is usually recommended. The precautions, flexible soft quality catheter is preferred. Transient paresthesia is very common during insertion, usually at the time of insertion, but uh, no need to worry. It disappears after a short length of insertion. Not more than 2 to 3 cm in subarachnoid space is recommended. There is a high risk of infection, so keeping the catheter for more than 24 hours is not recommended. To prevent PDPH, keeping catheter in place for 24 hours and injecting saline before removal is sometimes recommended. Strict labeling to avoid the postoperative mishap, mishaps. It may be mistaken for an epidural catheter and a large drug may be pushed through it. So strict labeling of a spinal catheter is mandatory. Risk, advantage and disadvantages. Risk of continuous spinal anesthesia is similar to any neuroxial blockade. Advantages, it is very quick, easy and has a definitive end point. There are very minimal hemodynamic fluctuations, useful when accidental neuropuncture occurs in epidural. Disadvantages are risk of infection, PDPH cannot be used for more than 24 hours for post-op analgesia. But still, continuous spinal anesthesia is a useful asset to have in every anesthesiologist's uh, armamentarium. Thank you. Thanks. I'm sorry for the uh, interruption in between. Hello. Okay. Hello. Hello. Good evening, friends. Uh, hope you, all of you have enjoyed uh, Naresh Paliwal sir's presentation on segmental spinal, continuous spinal, uh, and uh, 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 spinal with isobaric drugs. It was an excellent presentation by Paliwal sir and. Uh, uh, it was like a magic for all of us. Uh, many of us have no, not given uh, segmental spinal any time and uh, it was a uh, fast time for us. Uh, and uh, for me, it was like a wonder. It was like a magic. Um, I've never done it, uh, but uh, after watching uh, Paliwal's presentation, uh, now I can say that I'm confident uh, giving in, in some of the cases. I have. Uh, obviously, I will start with uh, some normal ASA one grade patient uh, patients. Uh, then 
can try in uh, difficult cases also so uh, i i believe all of you have some questions uh, i do have some questions so i will uh, start uh, question Uh, some questions to Paliwal sir, then Dr. Tarun Vagila and Dr. Rajesh Shah. Uh, like uh, uh, Paliwal sir, uh, Tarun Vagila is also practicing uh, segmental spinal, practicing uh, segmental spinal, especially uh, after this COVID era, because it uh, with that you can prevent the uh, intubation and you can do this. Surgeries under regional anesthesia only. So I will uh, start uh, uh, with uh, uh, Paliwal has obviously presented the thing. So I will ask, like to ask the Tawa first uh, about uh, 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 his experience regarding uh, uh, segmental spinal anesthesia. In which surgery do you use uh, segmental spinal Tarun Bai? Uh, usually all laparoscopic surgeries with the perforation of appendix, gallbladder. Or any visra plus uh, all routine surgeries now because the lockdown is over. So uh, plan surgery like uh, ovarian cyst, total laparoscopic hysterectomy, and appendectomy, plan hernia. I have not uh, done yet, but before that uh, COVID uh, started, I have usually done the uh, hernia also, unilateral hernia, incisional hernia. And all type of abdominal surgery we can usually do, and I am usually doing all these type of surgeries. Sir, are you using in an MRM or uh, thoracic surgeries? Uh, not yet, but uh, just I was uh, shown uh, thoracic surgeries video yesterday, Doctor Parivar sir, and I inspired and uh, try to give in uh, next patient. Actually, we did one thoracic. So, so, sir, when you started. Uh, I have started in more okay, uh, month so of December. Sir, okay. Yeah. I, so, what was your first case? Started, what was your experience? Uh, so my first case was uh, for uh, gallbladder laparoscopic cholecystectomy with the morbid obese patient and hypertension and diabetes. So, I would start uh, directly jump on this high risk patient and uh, GA preparation was kept beside. But uh, it was done done very nicely, and one and a half hour surgery done within totally segmental spinal, and patient is also happy, and surgeon is also happy. That built my confidence. Uh, actually, I will also advise this uh, okay. jumping to directly uh, morbid patients because in that case you can even justify giving segmental spinal. Other than going in for ASA one or two patients, you can directly use in some. Uh, High risk patients. Otherwise, also you can okay, give general sir. anesthesia. Okay, sir. So you can justify giving segmental okay, spinal. Sir. So, Pali yes, sir. So, Paliwal, sir, when you started doing uh, this uh, segmental spinal in your practice, uh, and why you started uh, eight ten years back? It was actually by compulsion. Uh, when you get a patient uh, of two point five grams of hemoglobin, bilateral pneumonia. Eight days old perforation at midnight, and if you don't do it, the patient will go to home and let them die. This is Adivasi patient, and when you get such patient with just 2.5 grams of hemoglobin, just ATBP at midnight. Uh, so I developed this technique initially for uh, high risk patients with just 1.5 ml. I did that case, and that patient survived. Initially, we did only just uh, drainage of the purse and all. And colostomy, and then after one month, after building the patient, uh, we did the second surgery. So it was uh, sort of by compulsion, almost uh, eight, ten years back. And then also I did some uh, very VIP patients, like uh, mother of anesthetist. I even posted that she was a diabetic, hypertensive, with uh, obstructed uh, umbilical hernia. Uh, she was uh, bedridden, and. Uh, she was refused by many intensive care hospitals. Accordingly, I just there yeah, yeah, was so, so as, as you sir uh, said, sir, you started before ten years. So w was there enough evidence at that time, or uh, from where you learned it? Actually, I did it first, and then search for the references, and then when I got the references, then it was no stopping back. Actually, I did it first, and then 
saw some references for segmental spinal and then uh, started presenting this topic i presented at many conferences initially there was lot lot of criticism actually it's still going on but now people have started accepting it i agree because of some uh, so rajesh bhai when did you rajesh bhai when did you started giving uh, this thing segmental spinal mm, i think rajesh bhai is not audible Mm-hmm. We can't hear you, Rajesh Bhai. Damn it, Rajesh Bhai. I I, I think we 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 will go ahead with Arun uh, Bhai and uh, Narish sir because Rajesh Bhai is not audible. So, uh, uh, uh-huh. Paliwal sir, how you decide the level of the block? In which type of surgery you give at uh, lower yeah, thoracic depends. level or at uh, mid thoracic uh, yes. level or upper yes, thoracic level? Yes, it depends level. on uh, what type of surgery it is. Generally, for laparoscopic surgeries, you need levels around T two, T three, at least. So, right. for laparoscopic right. surgeries, you need to go prick at a higher up with a low dose. especially for laparoscopy even for laparoscopy appendix even this uh, simple procedures like ectopic or ovarian cyst or gallbladder you need levels at least up to t2 and even with that high levels there is usually no discomfort because of the low dose of the drug used uh, actually it is only sensory and uh, patients uh, usually don't have any respiratory discomfort or hemodynamic fluctuations and for open surgeries like umbilical hernia epigastric hernia even a level of t4 is sufficient for open surgeries and below umbilical surgeries as you know t12 level is enough t i mean uh, t12 not t12 t6 t7 that's enough so it depends on what type of surgery it is what are the comorbidities if there are a lot of comorbidities then usually combined with epidurals so that i can use a very little dose even 1 ml of uh, drug in segmental spinals so that you can top up with epidurals if required like in yesterday's mrm i just used 1 ml of lubepivacaine with 25 mg of micrograms of fentanyl and as the level was not achieved properly it was just e8 so i topped up with 3 ml of uh, 0.25% lubepivacaine after 10 minutes and then the level was adequately achieved so it depends on what type of surgery it is what are the comorbidities and even who the surgeon is how fast he is or even a lot of factors but usually the patients are mobilized in 4 to 6 hours so so sir have you used, uh, used anything uh, other than a levo bp yeah i use everything i use op we can also for recently recently for very short procedures uh, i use this chlorprocaine it's very good but uh, you need to know that the procedure will not uh, go beyond 45 minutes like in uh, tibectomy said so mtp tibectomy then uh, diagnostic laparoscopy these are the procedures where the procedure will hardly take more than 45 minutes but before the uh, effect of chlorprocaine goes off you need to supplement with some analgesics like i supplement with paracetamol diclofenac before the effect is worn off so that the patient has a nice post operative period and uh, very early ambulation there is a question uh, from a member that uh, how how to use a bupivac and heavy successfully for segmental spinal for lap coli so Uh, uh, bupivac and heavy for segmental spinal in left coli, sir. Uh, you can use it. I mean, uh, punch at the at the same levels, and uh, you can adjust the levels accordingly with uh, heavy bupivac. Once the desired level, say up to T two, is achieved, uh, you can make the table straight. But the level should be at least uh, around T two T three. Once the level is used, and he, uh, also in laparoscopic cholecystectomy, what they use is a head up position afterwards. So there is no issue of the level going higher. And with with hyperbaric open cholecystectomy is much easier. 
with hyperbaric drugs. What you have to do is right. You right. just uh, keep the patient in the right lateral position. Give a uh, uh, high thoracic, I mean uh, thoracic spinal abs around uh, T8 pre 10, which is 1.5 to 2 ml of the drug. Keep the patient in the same position for around two minutes, so that the high level is achieved on the right side. And after turning, there is also effect on the other side, but uh, slightly lower level. You don't need uh, high levels on the opposite side. So I have done this also for open cholecystectomies. Like the video right, you saw, Karul, by have you done the drug? Uh, no, I have used only liver and I. No, I have added to uh, use fentanyl only. No other drug to use for this segment. Even, even dexmed, even dexmed is good. Dexmed uh, pull on the effect, 10 micrograms. Uh, at, so, sir, do. Do you require uh, any sedation, uh, sedation uh, during this procedure, like for shoulder pain or uh, for some discomfort to the patient or anything else? No, if the levels are good, then nothing is required. I mean, totally nothing. I, even there was a witness from your uh, Gujarat only, uh, one person, uh, Patel. Uh, he saw the, I mean, he was there in the OT. He saw there was literally nothing. And patient didn't complain anything. If the levels are adequate, if the levels are not good, then patient may experience shoulder pain. At that time, you can give some few milligrams of ketamine or fentanyl, or you can even convert it to GA with IGL. That is sufficient. Yeah, right, sir. So, how uh, uh, if you take hundred cases, how many in how many cases you need to convert it to GA? Uh, in a, your experience, sir. <laughs> it will be unbelievable, but uh, till it not converted any patient to GA. I mean, if the surgery gets prolonged, then only. Uh, sedation required in most okay, cases. So in most of the cases, you were yeah, able to yeah, sedation is required in quite a few cases initially. But since uh, I started achieving levels perfectly, the sedation also is very minimally required. But not converted to GA just because. Uh, right, sir. Thing. Right. Yes, uh, once the level are not achieved, then you need patients. Right, sir. Tarun, by your experience? Yeah, there is no need of any kind of supplementation of the general anesthesia. I have conducted 30 patients in this COVID era and 20 patients before that, uh, around 50 cases. But only one patient required supplementation with ketamine. That in that case, that source is the level was not achieved. Uh, so the, when the peritoneum is touching, the patient feels pain. At that time, only 25 to 30 milligram ketamine is supplemented, and patients uh, done procedure throughout the nicely, no problem at all. And uh, all cases, I think, uh, not converted in any GA or uh, any other supplementation. This so 25 milligram fentanyl is added in the uh, segment uh, the rest of 75 milligram fentanyl is added in the running point. So, patient will uh, be comfortable. Even Rajesh Bhai has right. done one. Uh, uh, there is question from Sunil. Rajesh Bhai has done some breast surgery last week, bilateral ductal, some carcinoma. He sent me a video. Yeah. Rajesh Bhai is doing it regularly, but unfortunately, because of uh, uh, yeah, entire yeah, tissue yeah. is not uh, visible or uh, audible. Yeah. So another question is from Dr. Su operating, uh, operating time is limiting factor in spinal anesthesia so, uh, in prolonged surgery especially. So how do you deal with it, sir? Uh, Paliwal, sir. Generally, it is to be anticipated. I mean, you have to have a thorough assessment of the patient. If you feel that the surgery may get prolonged, then combine it with epidurals or in a very unexpected cases, you may have to convert it to general anesthesia. Yesterday's MRM took almost four right, hours. Uh, so I had that epidural in place, so there was no issue at all. And also, during the operative procedure, I gave PEC1, PEC2 block under vision. I asked the surgeon to push the drug. So that kept my epidural top-ups to very limited. Just three top-ups needed during a four-hour surgery. So you can right, change your right, techniques accordingly. Uh, 
So uh, another question is, if I do you counsel the patient for segmental spinal for upper abdominal surgery? Uh, like patient is coming for PSE and uh, you are going to do under uh, segmental spinal. So how do you counsel? Because it is a different procedure. So uh, do you uh, uh, explain about any complications or any difficulties uh, during uh, procedure the patient, to the patient? The patient is educated. I do explain. But uh, here... The patients don't understand anything many times. You just say ki mujhe kuch pata nahi chalna chahiye. You do whatever you want to do. So most <laughs> of the times the situation is like that. If the patient is educated, I tell them what we are going to do. Yeah, right, and, sir. Uh, and I mean, I tell them. Even yesterday, I convinced the patient. She was uh, repeatedly telling me she was obese patient. Just mujhe behosh kar do, behosh kar do. I said, if you feel anything, I'll change it to GA. But later on, she thanked me. So, it yeah, was right, very... we don't so, have that. Uh, uh, yes. What is your experience? Hello. Tarun Bhai, how do you explain to the patient? Yeah, just uh, as routine, our spinal, as we explain in spinal analysis, a routinely lumbar spinal, same explanation, but I usually say that we will give some effort and uh, we will be comfortable. If any breathing problem is there, then you just know me. I will uh, supplement us and, or whatever we do. Uh, and we are uh, monitoring that ETCO to level also and uh, SCO to all other parameters. So usually we can come to know that um, there is some problem in the ETCO2, that it is in the hyper cardia is going over or SCO2 is falling, then we have to convert it. But till now, no patient is complaining of anything or like that. Even the uh, advantages of uh, one patient of that ovarian fish, that uh, we have take, uh, taken for the ovarian cystectomy only, but the ovary is so badly in, uh, disease, so ophectomy was planned. And the husband uh, told and explained about this, but the uh, husband said, uh, take the consent of the patient. And uh, just we, the surgeon come to know that we are only in final anesthesia. So we show to the patient all this ovary, her ovary and all these things, and she gives consent and I have recorded in my mobile. So you can have that added, added advantage of uh, taking a threat from the consent. Yeah, that is real. Uh, one shot. Rajesh Bhai, can you hear us? Hello. Rajesh, Rajesh Bhai, yes, now you are audible. Hi, sir, I am Rajesh Bhai. Audible? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, audible. yeah, you are audible, but uh, yeah. Yes. So, so next, yes, uh, yes. next question comes to uh, uh, Pali, sir. When you started uh, this new technique, uh, there uh, was there any resistance from surgeons? How you uh, convince surgeons for this procedure? Mm, no, initially I did for uh, high risk cases, so there was no other option. All the cases were refused by somewhere else. So once they started believing in me, so they don't actually ask what I am doing. They have full faith. So they, if uh, they want a GA, suppose uh, sometimes. Uh, because of other surgeons saying that G is better than spinal. Because I have seen this in many workshops. People from higher centers, they don't like spinal anesthesia. Uh, so I give general anesthesia, no problem. General anesthesia can be as uh, competently even as uh, this thing. But uh, it saves many things. It saves pollution, it saves discomfort. And one more tip I would like to give is, the higher you go, uh, yes, reduce the dose accordingly. I mean, you know, just like MRM, you give spinal at a higher level, so reduce the dose accordingly to avoid uh, respiratory discomfort. If you want to use a lower dose, a higher dose, then go <coughs> on the lower spaces so that there is adequate spread. Hello. Rajesh Bhai is uh, audible. Uh, Rajesh, Bhai, oh, Rajesh Bhai, what is your experience regarding surgeon's resistance? Uh, yes, uh, actually, I have started I... segmental spinal since uh, almost more than one year now. Am I yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, audible. Yeah, yeah, you are audible. Okay, okay. So I started almost more than one year, uh, and my experience is uh, uh, the date. It's very good with the high risk patient. Uh, this gives you a very good hemodynamic stability. And at one replacement center, I am doing most ninety percent cases with the the same, uh, Liu and Avin and all this. Uh, the most important and interesting case was once the patient was referred to me for not getting intubated at some tertiary care institute. So then I tried to have a fiber optic. I tried it for a thrice with the fiber optic uh, and with the wire inside the larynx, but still we intubated it. Uh, we could intubate, but we didn't have a it is due to graph and tracing. so it was not getting properly ventilated and for that yeah, reason, then them. we decided to go for a segmental spinal uh, for the lap coli and that was done uh, and with the covid era i am doing all the surgery from shoulder to toes with the segmental spinal i like already told that before few back i had uh, done bilateral breast uh, ductal papilloma carcinoma uh, under uh, the segmental spinal with epidural backup Uh, I done one case uh, which was bad, which was refused by the SRDs at the other places. Place for the perforate GB with pleural effusion with baseline saturation was eighty six, and we did a lap coli uh, in this COVID era for the segment uh, with the segmental spinal. The thing is, uh, if we give at the proper level and achieve the proper level, then uh, patients uh, very comfortable. Uh, as sir told, we just require to have a twenty to thirty milligram uh, catadex combination. That's it to sedate the patient. Uh, and the laparoscopy usually the gap is over, so claustrophobia is also there. So to to avoid that, also we require to have a sedation. But otherwise, there was no uh, major issues for the surgery. Even surgeons were appreciated uh, for the. All right. So these things. Excellent. So it is one of the good modalities. All right. Thank you, Rajesh. And I think uh, the most of the credit goes to the Paliwal sir. Okay. Thank you, sir. <laughs> yes. Next question is very good. Uh, uh, next next question. Yeah. Uh, um, next question is: uh, Do you monitor ETCO2 while doing laparoscopic surgery, and uh, how you do it, yeah. uh, uh, Paliwal sir? There are different modes actually. I had. Uh, no, 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 no. I honestly no during the spontaneous respiration. I am not monitoring it is CO2. Yeah. I am monitoring. I had I developed different modes actually. I have uh, that special catheter tip attached to this uh, it is CO2 uh, this thing or through the mask. I have posted actually uh, many times on the forum about how to monitor the it is CO2 during spontaneous respiration. And I have that it is good monitor, and I usually monitor it. Arun, by how do you do it? Yeah, yeah. With the standard it is good to monitor the cap capillary muscle. You just need if you don't have that high five nasal prongs and attach and all these things. You don't want to do any jiggling. Just take a scalpel. Just take a scalpel and cut the needle end and uh, yes, insert so in the mouth with the jelly. That is the very easiest and comfortable uh, way of uh, monitoring the ETC. So even the intracat, 20 gauge intracat can be cut and right. put inside. And uh, uh, ha, 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 ha. and how is the um, uh, muscle relaxation? Uh, how does it feel for a muscle relaxation? Is it adequate uh, with uh, this thing, uh, segmental spinal, yes. or they complain of less? Yeah, yeah. It is a problem with some muscular and very. Healthy patients, so you need some higher doses. Actually, it can't be done with just two ml. Either you need higher doses, or you change your laparoscopic. This is an issue with, especially with open surgeries, the uh, under very muscular, very I mean tight muscles patients. Otherwise, in female patients and morbid ill patients, absolutely no issue of relaxation. Well, some surgeons are uh, complaining okay, uh, less relaxation in GA also. So some are. Yeah, that cannot be done in any way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Rajesh, my what is your? What I am speaking is, uh, it is a problem, but uh, you need some higher doses, at least three ml, or you change over to this hyperbaric drugs uh, for uh, very muscular patient. Right. So, sir, when you are giving spinal in a patient, 
uh, fourth position is prefer like sitting or lateral uh, and then when when you are giving a spinal in a, at thoracic level uh, will you go at uh, with a midline approach or with paramedian approach i usually do it in lateral position and always in the midline this thing unless there is difficulty uh, i mean once in a year or two i require to give sitting position otherwise i do all patients in lateral position and with a midline approach now i have that right uh, how do you do it rajesh yes sir please go ahead sir Aliwal, now i am learning to use uh, usg i <laughs> have that usg and very soon i mean those okay. who are having this facility available they can use utilize this for giving thoracic epidural spinal for the safety of the patient if they feel like not uh, doing it they can use ultrasound uh, machine it will be more safe i just try right, to sir. scan the uh, what is your experience sir? hello tarun bhai how do you do it uh, i have done all cases in sitting position with the paramedian approach and in single trick usually there is no resistance at all and uh, very less distance is there compared to the lumbar region and uh, i am getting easily not a, any difficult one than the lumbar even sometimes lumbar may be difficult this thoracic is never difficult so in sitting position with the paramedian approach so what precaution do you take to avoid uh, spinal injury no go slowly after giving local anesthesia go very slowly very gentle and uh, and don't uh, insert the needle more as we are doing in lumbar uh, very short distance you can uh, come to know your the feeling of ligament of flavor and the dura puncture it requires some of experience but as usual we have all our experience well experience in the lumbar region so in thoracic region only one thing go very gentle and very slowly and uh, very less distance is there that you should be keep in mind yes you need patience you need yes, patience sir. i mean you yeah. have to go bit by bit uh, even if you stop at uh, first epidural level then see for the so no harm in doing that you have to go bit by bit once you get uh, accustomed to it then you can do it easily there's no issues sir sir what do you do if patient complains of uh, breathing uh, difficulty or uh, patient uh, desaturates uh either because of the high spinal or uh, because of any or sedation used then you can supplement any time with uh, uh whatever options you have if the patient is fasting you can use your igl you can intubate the patient you don't have to worry actually okay, for a high so these cases even with levels you have seen that up to c4 c5 6 the patients you didn't require oxygen uh, no it was required the right. oxygen is maintained above 95 96 right sir tarun bhai your experience uh not at a single person complain yet but uh, ready for any type of uh, general anesthesia is no problem ready. we are ready uh, we are ready for doing anything like igl we also ready intubation and uh, that everything is kept ready at any moment uh, if you feel that we have to convert it to converting the ga right sir so parival sir this is the question for you have you encountered encountered any complication with the segmental spinal no, not till that uh, once or twice i experienced a paresthesia while doing it but uh, that time i was worried about it but then gone through the literature uh, usually there is no problem even even if you encountered some paresthesia many times you encountered it during lumbar spinal also but uh, i watched the patient yeah. next day was worried about it uh, this was some four five years back but <laughs> uh, patient nothing happened no no i mean tarun bhai i stopped till that we yeah, had the same risk as lumbar region it's great sir tarun bhai yeah not in right right but uh, so there is a question for 
Yes. Hello. Uh, so there is a question from a uh, member that will it hold it its ground in court of law if there is there is any complication? Mm, that is a issue that uh, <laughs> then we have to justify. That's why I ask you. You should start with uh, very morbid patients. Then you can justify doing it. And once you do it in morbid patients, you can very well do it in so, routine patients. So that is a question. Uh, I don't have any answer so, so, for that. Whether it will be justified in the court. So I, I believe there is, there is enough. Evidence. There is enough evidence. You can say for, for uh, uh, segmental spinal even in. Uh, Yeah, even in Nysora, they have uh, included yeah, yeah, uh, thoracic yeah. spinal. Right? Even so, in uh, Nysora, I think you. Even in it. the uh, Millers, there is a short this thing. The your book of Aura has included uh, one chapter. Your book is there, na? Aura. So they have yeah, included yeah. thoracic spinal in their uh, so, uh, uh, book. So there is yeah. enough evidence. So I believe we have enough evidence. Yes, yeah. enough evidence on yeah. it also. So, and uh, everything uh, uh, i think uh, yeah i think i try so to I, i think we can give it hello boliye yeah yeah so uh, when you convert uh, The spinal into GA. Suppose some patient complains of breathing difficulty or some pain, and when you convert it into GA, then there is any chance of hemodynamic stability, especially in uh, uh, this morbidly ill patients, severe hypotension or anything else like bradycardia. Mm, not, not as such. There is a perfect hemodynamic stability with uh, low doses of drugs used. Uh, even with such high levels, uh, yesterday there was just one fall. Uh, to the level of 88 systolic, but after that, nothing, no tachycardia, no bradycardia, and till date, though there is slight hypotension in the initial 10 minutes, but not encountered a severe bradycardia in any of the patients. With properly used drugs, right, sir. Uh, so I think we have covered more. Yes, sir. so i think we have covered most questions from the uh, viewers uh, and uh, we are done with it uh, before ending the session any concluding remarks from you sir mm. first of all i would like to thank you and all the task members for giving me this opportunity and it's a good technique but uh, you need to know in which patients to use it and uh, to start with you can use it uh good indications so that you can justify and then as a routine it can be done when there are enough evidences about it so that you can be safe in the and justifying yourself thank you sir there anything from you no uh just sir said all the things start doing it then And just before starting, uh, thoroughly read the own sir's books and sir's uh, sir's lectures. Also read, uh, listen four five times and do gently and start doing. Then you can come to know the complication. It can be. And then you can uh, you, you can ask the sir and sir is helping a lot uh, to everyone. And that's it. No, no special, no any precautions. Till that, I have not used any methadone, any tartrine or ephedrine to any patients. They are hemodynamically stable. No need for any drugs. And uh, even IV fluid also, we, what we are giving, eighteen to hundred ml per hour. That's enough. No need to preload also. Yes, with uh, repeatedly doing it, you can use thank you, 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 and the most important is the patients are usually discharged in the evening with uh, this thing most of our patients like laparoscopic tubectomies and they are discharged after 4 hours 5 hours they comfortably go home there is nothing this thing um, uh, even catheterization is not required most of the times so i think uh, thank you very much sir thank you tarun bhai thank you thank you for uh, helping me so it was the next I troubled you a lot, so it was an. 
uh, it was an excellent session everybody learned something new uh, and on task we will keep doing it uh, and uh, please uh, just uh, tomorrow for uh, uh, eco learning with uh, dr amar janakre at 7 pm it is on 7 pm Ru routinely we do it at uh, 6 have, pm but tomorrow it will be at uh, 7 pm so people want it i have some ty oh. numerics ready for this thing specially dex kit yeah sir uh, we, we, if yeah we, we are waiting for that also yeah yeah we will definitely time later in which sir sir dex kit is very popular okay, thank you thank you very much thank yeah. you all okay thank you thank you thank you thank you sir bye bye thank you bye bye good night good night good night